Well, welcome everyone to this session um, of um, which uh, at the Institute of Modern Languages Research, this online session um, uh, in the series um, of seminars, World Literature and Translation, which is co-convened by the London Intercollegiate um, uh, Network for Comparative Studies and the Institute of Modern Languages Research. And uh, I'm delighted to have uh, Mohammed Hamdan here uh, with us today. And I'll introduce Mohammed in a second, but I first wanted to just go over uh, some of um, the housekeeping for this session in terms of um, asking questions and uh, engaging with the chat. Um, obviously, we'll be quite used to these online sessions by now. Um, the chat, uh, which you'll find in the, in the bottom of the screen, is open so you can ask questions as we go along of Mohammed and I can pick up those questions at the end and, and put them to him. Alternatively, you can raise your digital hand in the Q&A at the end and I'll um, ask you to come and, come and uh, ask your question. Now, uh, this session is being recorded. So if you don't want to be recorded, then you should um, turn off your, your video. And if you'd like to ask a question without being recorded, then you can send that question to me in the chat and I'll happily put that to, to Mohammed. So um, welcome Mohammed, and thank you very much for agreeing to uh, deliver this, what looks like a fascinating paper today. Um, Mohammed uh, uh, Hamdan is Associate Professor um, of Anglo-American Literary Studies at Anadja National University, Palestine. His main research interests include 19th century transatlantic fi fiction, gender studies, and Victorian literature. And currently he's particularly interested in literary translation and comparative studies on exile, landscape, and national identity in modern Palestinian, Arab, and Israeli fiction. And Mohammed just mentioned to me that this paper today um, that he's presenting uh, will be published as an article in the uh, Translation Studies Journal, Target. Um, so it will be published as an article in Translation Studies uh, Journal, Target. So Mohammed, um, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to you. Um, Mohammed's title, just before you begin, Mohammed, is Rewriting the Indian Other, a post-colonial translation of Rudyard Kipling's The Story of Mohammed Din into Arabic. Thanks, Mohammed. Okay, thank you uh, very much, uh, Joe. <clears throat> so before I start, uh, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Joseph Ford for inviting me to talk about uh, my uh, uh, most recent research on post colonial translation as part of online seminar uh, series entitled Word Literature and Translation uh, at the Institute of Modern Languages Research, the University of London. Uh, and I was actually, uh, uh, recommended uh, by my uh, friend and colleague, Dr. Naomi Wells, uh, who passed my details to Dr. Joseph, and so thank you. And my thanks, of course, also go to the audience uh, who are here today to listen to this paper. Uh, so let me just start by, can, can you see my screen? Is that clear? I can, yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, in his uh, questions, the sociology, uh, uh, Pierre Bourdieu says or states that every exercise of power is accompanied, accompanied sorry, by a discourse whose purpose is to legitimize the power of the person exercising it. Now to, to Bourdieu, it is significant that the, this discourse remains hidden in order for power relations between colonizers and the colonized to be effective, uh, stable, and re remain forceful. So within a, a colonial discourse, power has always been you know, foregrounded as a historical construct that is, uh, or that culturally and sociopolitically cultivates the alienation of the, of the racial other as unfit, low, uh, and backward. Uh, the meaning of power stems from uh, the birthing of, uh, of patterns of hegemonic exercises through which the Western self and native other are produced as superior and marginal, respectively. In Letters from Prison, Antonio Gramsci defines hegemony as cultural leadership, uh, 
which is generally understood as a negative ideology of power of force that is imposed on inactive masses by dominant colonial powers. Throughout centuries of colonization, this hegemonic ideology uh, has been embodied in and fostered by different kinds of media, one of which, of course, is, is literature. Now, by operating as a long-term make-believe medium of stereotypical racial uh, representation, literature has the ability to offer a discursive legitimacy that displays and perpetuates a violent imperial propaganda. And here, Edward Said, in his famous uh, manuscript, Orientalism, reminds us that European discourses on the Orient point to cultural, social, and political deficiencies or shortcomings that become naturally visualized by the European reader as a violent response to the possible threat to Western civilization. If we look at the uh, uh, Edward Said uses these examples in his book where he says that Ascalus uh, uh, is the Perigians, Euripides is the, 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 the Bach or the Bach. We note that if we look at these works, we note that Asia, for example, is portrayed as a barbaric, destructive other that lies beyond the sea. So in, also in, in, in 19th century and 20th century, remarkable literary works similarly uh, um, the domination of this alien other and the distant uh, places where he or she lives becomes an imperial necessity that is intrinsically tied with political and economic aspirations. Jane Austen's uh, Mansfield Park, Rudyard Kipling's Kim, and Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness, to mention but a few, manifest this uh, colossal tie between the rising power of the of the British Empire and its uh, persistent endeavors to dominate other peoples and lands on the one hand, and the vital uh, employment of literature as a means to fashion theories of uh, English cultural superiority at the expense of other forms of nationalism, far beyond the, the European shores. So this literature uh, produces a certain power of seduction that elicits submission cultural commitment and emotional attachment on the part of the colonized subjects. In his account of the Indian encounter of, of English colonizers, Charles uh, Trevelyan argues that the passion for the fantastical or magical English knowledge became a necessary daily taste for Indian readers. As you can see here on the screen, Trivian states that steamboats passing up and down the gangs and boarded by native boys, are boarded, sorry, by native boys, begging not for money, but for books. So the pursuit of English knowledge turns into an object of desire uh, that facilitates the exercise of hegemony over the subaltern here by a means of a translation as well. So by using translation as a medium of cultural communication, Indian readers also become involved either directly or indirectly in the establishment of a colonial enterprise that thrives on the fat meat of cultural and political differences. In this regard, Maria Timishko says or states that translation is not an innocent process. Translation is not an innocent process because it savagely feeds on the differences between cultures sometimes. So translators here can be seen as manipulative agents whose work may result in textual rearrangement, semantic re displacement, and, and thus inequality. Susan Bassnett accordingly suggests that translation, uh, translation has become no less important or inferior to uh, uh, to the de facto presence of the original text. Translation indeed sustains uh, cultural forms and regulates certain political practices in colonies. Uh, since the history of the colony is overwritten by the colonizer, the industry of translation in this regard has, has always played a central role in producing texts which were governed by, dominant, by the dominant European norms as helped, of course, by Jeremy Monday. Lawrence 
Venuti therefore invites us to rethink the many possibilities of a translation, which must interrogate all cultural forms and political practices by focusing on what Jean-Jacques uh, uh, Circle calls the reminder, what we call uh, also the, the, what is called the, the textual leftovers. This implies that um, original texts are always, sorry, always, uh, original texts always remain excellent sites that are open to the exploration of the suppressed cultural terrains and identification of the native voices and hidden energy in colonial discourses. Uh, since the 1950s, translation has become dominated by what Maria Tomischko again and Edwin Jensler called Powater. Powater is a concept which points to a new turn in the past century that brought along significant shifts in translation studies by reinvestigating or renegotiating the meaning and location of power. Within this term, this power term, translators have become more endowed with an energy uh, to redefine power and I'm quoting here, to situate precisely and convey intact the otherness of the original. And uh, this is quoted by, uh, sorry, from uh, John, George Steiner. As, as, as highlighted by George Stein. So even though the translator's intervention uh, in such case may be regarded as a kind of, uh, of exaggeration of textual mediation, which may distort the objective face of the text, he or she retains um, an authorial cutting edge influence that is needed to rebel against the singularity or one-sidedness of the hegemony of Western culture via resistance. So uh, in his article on Nietzsche, Nietzsche uh, genealogy history, Michel Foucault states that where, where there is power, there is resistance. Uh, and this statement by Foucault shows that resistance is a natural force that comes to explicate and question fixed historical relations between the powerful self and the less privileged other. The translator, as noted by Foucault, is a genealogist who, quotation mark, needs history to dispel the cameras, the cameras of the origin. By, uh, by destabilizing uh, grand narratives from within. So the translator, in other words, must treat history as a, as a discontinuous narrative in which representations of self and other are truly uh, and must be truly displaced. Um, speaking of origins, Jacques Derrida as well holds that there is no longer a simple origin, meaning that translation and retranslation can function as acts of rewriting the metaphysics of origin. Or for example, let's say, rewriting the conventional representations of Indian or African characters in European histories, literatures, and translations. Along the same lines, Walter Benjamin, Walter Benjamin insists that origins are translatable and that meanings do not remain closed off references. So the, so the fact that original texts and their translations are retranslatable signifies the multiple interpretations of these texts, signifies that, sorry, that multiple interpretations of these texts uh, will always survive the regime of the historicity of meaning. The, the English, sorry, the Egyptian scholar um, and translator Marwa Shakri tells us that translation remains a, a zone of contestation. Uh, if we think of a translation as a creative act, we can then suppose that the original text is not the only source of meaning. Samah Salim, another Egyptian translator and scholar state, states that creative translatability can go, be, can go as far as to employ uh, the strategies of plagiarism, forgery, pseudo-translation in the production of popular fiction, uh, which can be seen in translation of some classical Arab, Arabic fiction. Of course, this came under attack later by uh, famous uh, Arab writers and critics such as the Palestinian Lebanese Muhammad Yusuf Najm and the Egyptian Ta'af Hussein, 
Egyptian writer, Saddam Hussein, who impugned the modernist technique that introduced European rhetoric um, to the classical body of Arabic literature, thus resulting in what Salim calls bad translation. So the constant cultural crossing here between Arabic and European languages and literatures at the beginning of the 20th century created a double-faced relationship with the European text, texts. Uh, Shadin Taglin, another Egyptian critic and translator, says that Arabic translators back then occupied an amb ambivalent position. On the one hand, they were seduced by modern bondages to translatable imperial signifiers. And on the other hand, they had yet to remain resistant to European cultures. But this ambivalence or oscillation here, generally speaking, between authority and arbitration or between languages such as Indian and English or Arabic and French, means that original texts can move beyond time, place, and context and can thus be relocated in a new social uh, or, uh, or, or national context. So translators therefore uh, can therefore give life uh, to the text beyond its original language and culture. And in so doing, they may articulate the abusive features or aspects that stand out as the suppressed energy of the text. Translation operates as resistance to what is taken or seen as usual or uh, as usual narrative or, uh, uh, or useful values in original texts in order to frustrate uh, discursive activities of the imperial agents. In rendering original texts from outside perspectives to the inside, um, to the inside narrative, Post-colonial translators can reconsider uh, white hegemonic practices by re redesignating what is indeed useful or not. So what is viewed as not useful here in a European original or translated even text is the vital lack that runs through the body of the text and which the translator uh, seeks to unravel. In Kipling's The Story of Muhammad Deen, the sense of the useful or the, or, or, or the usual established by the imperial agent is uh, endorsed at many levels. Uh, a sense which ultimately persists to, uh, to enhance the suitability of the English character and the perfectibility of its perception of the absolute world, mean, a meaning or, or, or image. So the imperial expression of what is essentially useful which is ingrained in the intended dis, uh, colonial discourse in the text is what I basically seek to, uh, uh, to, uh, to resist in my translation of Kipling's uh, The Story of Muhammadin from English, of course, to Arabic through uh, manipulation and subversion. Uh, my examination of this story, uh, the, the story of Muhammadin benefits from the employment of translation as a mode of, as a tool or a mode of resistance against the practices of cultural familiarization or naturalization. So understanding the hidden mechanisms of familiarizing power and cultural superiority in Kipling's text allows Arab readers, my, my target audience here, to establish parallel experiences with their Indian counterparts bearing in mind that Kipling's characters are Muslims, with whom Arab readers can easily affiliate. So the translation of Kipling's story into Arabic uh, <clears throat> thus helps to establish a post-colonial transnational network of re-empowerment within which the otherization of Indians and Arabs in, in colonial discourses is brought into full conversation. Kipling's uh, the story of Muhammadin, by the way, uh, uh, published in the collection or, uh, called uh, uh, Plain Tales from the Hills in 1888, was written in a time when the English Empire was at its peak, especially during the, its rule of India from 1858 to 1947. The events of the story take place in India, where Kipling was born and, and raised. Uh, and uh, despite being born in the Bombay presidency of British India, 
Kipling was notably uh, imperialist. I'm quoting here, a jingo imp imperialist who was normally insensitive and aesthetically disgusting as asserted by George Orwell. In the story of Muhammad Deen, uh, the narrator, notably Anglo-Indian, accepts a native Indian boy named Muhammad Deen as his protege, uh, despite the cultural gaps that exist between both figures. In the narrator's household, Muhammad Deen and his father, Imam, start a polite friendship with this wealthy master of the house. Uh, <clears throat> now, this friendship, uh, however, doesn't last when Muhammadin dies suddenly in spite of the ample medical care he's given. When, co when called in to treat Muhammadin, the English doctor comments sternly that, quotation mark, these or they, referring to Indian children, uh, have no stamina, these brats, end of quotation. So even though Muhammadin receives treatment at the narrator's house better than what he gets at his father's, the doctor's statement obviously communicates a grim view of native Indians as unhealthy, uh, underdeveloped, dependent, and culturally inferior. So despite these colonial remarks, Kipling shows that English colonizers here are a kind of, he kind of trying to communicate the sense that English characters are humanistic and that the Indian revolution against the English empire at the time, one which eventually culminates in Muhammad Deen's death, was unnecessary. So Kipling here situates the Anglo-Indian master as the guardian of humanity, protection, etc., and salvation. Now, in my role as an English-Arab translator, I, I unmask Kipling's varied and apparent colonial categorizations that manifest a high level of oppression forced upon the marginalized other Indian in the story. The plot in Kipling's story is not modified in, in, my, in, my, in the process of the translation, my translation, which rather seeks to suppress certain elements of the racial discourse embodied in the language of the narrator and the English doctor. This allows the target reader to experience the original atmosphere of Kipling's text while subverting his or her uh, pre-reading binary or pre-presumptions uh, such as inferior, superior, superior, inferior, white, brown, or scientific and underdeveloped. Now, changing the plot means rewriting a new text, whereas translators can only, for example, let's say, uh, opt for changing the latent colonial language by suppressing, silencing, replacing, deleting, and adding particular linguistic structures that would, that would dissipate racial, national, or cultural tensions, tensions in the text. In my translation, however, I use the strategies of euphemism, deletion, addition, and replacement, which suppress the well-established colonial binary relations without affecting the coherence of the plot. In this case, Arab Muslim readers can access Kipling's story as a normal, unbiased, and comprehensible narrative. In the opening of the story, uh, the, the narrator, as a way of illustration, questions the concept of happiness. This is mentioned in the story. Uh, while witnessing a group of Indian children playing in the dust, as you can see on the screen here. The narrator says, who is the happy man? Uh, he that sees in his own house at home little children crowned with dust, leaping and falling and crying, which I have translated into Arabic as man huwa al-insan al-sa'id, وذلك الذي يرى من منزله الخاص أطفالا يقفزون ويلهون ويصيحون فرحا في وطنهم وقد على رؤوسهم غبار من ذهب. So just to give a bit of feedback on the statement, the narrator here situates himself as a humanitarian patron whose language establishes an emotional discourse of inclusion. His language, in other words, uh, seems to foreshadow an image of the English colonizer as a morally driven administrator who doesn't perpetuate the image of the imperial as condescending and, uh, and culturally superior. Uh, forging a unique British identity in the Indian metropolis, according to, uh, to David Lambert, was closely tied to, quotation, 
to the representation of West Indian slave societies as on English and as aberrant spaces that required metropolitan humanitarian intervention. So uh, Kipling's narrator uh, manifests the colonial thinking of the aberrant other and its undeserved Englishness through the symbolic association with the philanthropic eyes of the English character that generates a quasi-melodramatic scene of native Indians' public happiness. So the narrator's uh, initial words here, as you can see in the quotation, uh, enclose uh, universal philosophies about the conditions or meanings of the human happiness. However, this um, um, seemingly innocent discourse is subverted by a metaphor that links Indian children with the street dust, uh, constant falling and, and, and weeping. So despite the natural spontaneity of these children's daily activities, the narrator's metaphor provokes the image of the Indian child as leading a different lifestyle that is incompatible with the everyday habits of English children, for example. So considering the colonial context of the story, Certain words and phrases, such as crying and crown with dust, could enhance implicit and implicit negative attitude I seek to resist in my translation. Uh, so these expressions could display um, a sarcastic cultural representation of Indians as loud, dirty, and vulgar. Within the translator's description, English and international readers are directed to appraise the antithetical image of Indian street boys, that is, English children as civilized, clean, and decorous. <laughs> so the translation of the narrator's metaphor to Arabic, nonetheless, curtails the implicit cultural superiority incorporated at the onset of the story without necessarily causing an enormous change at the level of sentence structure and grammar. <laughs> In the Arabic translation, present participles such as crying, which is translated as yasihuna farahan, falling, yalhaun, and leaping, yakfizu, uh, denote a general sense of, uh, of, uh, of excitement or ecstasy that children normally uh, feel when they play with dust, sand, or, or, uh, or mud outside. And the, the phrase crown with dust, uh, more specifically, implies that these boys, uh, through constant playing and jumping, are too familiar with their homeland and available materials, which are common objects that bestow on them uh, a powerful cultural authenticity and a safe national identification. Uh, in contrast to the speaker's uh, negative attitude to a certain event, rendering crying and falling as a uh, um, respectively, means that children's uh, that the children's physical movement is uh, is in harmony with the surrounding landscape, uh, which is also portrayed in the Arabic translation as a, as a rich site of cultural heritage, memory, and continued presence. Uh, more importantly, here the translation of uh, of a crown with dust as وَقَدْ عَلَى رُؤُوسَهُمْ غُبَارٌ مِنْ ذَهَبٍ constitutes a shift from the original context that depicts Indian children or that insinuates or that, uh, um, um, that, let's say, that let's say portrays their presence as, uh, portrays them as dirty uh, and prone to disease to, due to uh, uh, their constant uh, bodily mobilities in the streets that are too uh, dusty in the summer. Um, so this is how I translated it. Uh, so however, the, here, the, my use of this euphemistic exp or expression or the, the, the euphemistic techniques used in the translation here, my translation, recreates dust as gold that falls delicately on the children's heads, thus forming a beautiful aesthetic scene of majestic crowning. Now, the, the image of the Indian uh, as inferior and uh, severe in, is further demonstrated by the writer through the submissive language of Muhammad Dean's father, a language which plays a double role in the story. So while Imam Dean's rhetoric and tone are fashioned uh, uh, to, to serve a submissive image of the Indian as vulnerable and 
unconfident through his polite request for the ball from the narrator, his language turns into a vulgar, uncivilized speech while he turns to his son. In the first instance, Imam Deem speaks eloquently and, uh, and, and respectfully uh, uh, to the Anglo-Indian uh, narrator when he says, quotation mark, by your honor's favor, I have a little son. He has uh, seen this ball and deserves it to play with. I do not want it for myself, end of quotation. So in his father's presence, however, Muhammad Deen is turned into a badmash, a badmash, which is a very common insult used in certain contexts to describe a deceitful, obnoxious, and worthless person. As you can see here in this quotation, this boy, said Imam Deen, judicially, is a bodmash, a big bodmash. He will, without doubt, go to the jail khana for his behavior. I translated this into Arabic as, I added a few things. قَالَ إِمَامُ الدِّينِ بِصَوْتٍ حَصِيفٍ يَشْدُقُ حِكْمَةً أَنَا أَعْتَذِرُ عَنْ تَصَرُّفَاتِ وَلَدِي غَيْرِ الْمَقْبُولَةِ مُذَكِّرًا إِيَّاهُ بِسِجْنِ خَانَةً أَلَّذِي يَذْهَبُ إِلَيْهِ كُلُّ مَنْ يُسِيءُ التَّصَرُّفَ أَوْ السُّلُوكِ now here the word bodmash is both deleted and replaced with the word unacceptable. In order to resist the culturally inscribed intensity of the father's speech, this replacement subverts the father's submissive tone to the narrator as well as overturns his aggression toward his son. Or by shifting the father's curse to a standard non-racial discourse, his rhetoric becomes philosophical and neutral because it positions Imam as a wise man who only speaks rationally and objectively, which is shown in the Arabic phrase, hasif yashtuku hikmata. So in order to reconstruct Kipling's allusions to the, to the Indian's violence, aggression, and inferiority in the Arabic translation, the word jail in this text is given as an institution of education. In Kipling's narrative, jail is used to allude to the necessary marginalization of the Indian other, who could have written well-established social and cultural order. In a subversive post-colonial translation yet, jail is an institution that does not imply the absence or loss of values of native individuals, hence their punishment. So within the Arabic translation, Imam al-Din's recourse to the jail propagates a de-racialized translation, or sorry, meaning, or place where people of different colors, religions, and nationalities could be incarcerated. So the fact that Imam al-Din feels sorry about the actions of his son signifies his serious attention to the latter's education and moral well-being, uh, which is a genuine, a genuine human value that is worthy of care and attention. So finally, as a concluding remark, as you can see, the translation of uh, Kipling's short story from English to Arabic recognizes the historical and cultural shifts in an Anglo-Indian context by offering uh, a post-colonial rendition to address the cultural biases in, in our modern day society and to explain the motivation behind the resistant translation of Kipling's text. The term resistance, by the way, is not only vague with regard to what is to be resisted, but it is also obscure as to how to resist, since the strategies used uh, to accomplish the act of resistance are multiple. Uh, um, here, Timishko again argues that no single strategy has been historically privileged uh, by successful activist translators. So the resistance strategy used in a specific context will remain temporary and limited by that context since there is no stable strategy that can be applied to all textual situations where, uh, where resistance is needed. Um, in, in, in this translation, the use of euphemism, for example, uh, the use of euphemism as a strategy, for instance, has achieved, let's say, desired effects by reproducing the Indian other as an aesthetic, powerful subject. The heavy colonial uh, uh, discourse uh, of Kipling's uh, text requires that a euphemistic translation or a representation, let's say, of Indians helps to bring to light the unfairly uh, 
uh, represented uh, other via translation as uh, resistance. So thank you very much for uh, listening to this paper. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matt. That's uh, for that fascinating, fascinating paper and uh, an insight into your into your work on this on this short story. I'll just remind people that you uh, can raise your digital hands or you can post in the chat if you if you can't find your digital hands, which uh, you should normally be able to find it in the reaction section at the bottom of the screen. Um, if you'd like to ask a question, I can see. Uh, someone's access to chat yet so the chat is working um, perhaps I'll kind of begin by asking my own question if I may Mohammed and um, people can have a kind of think about what they what kind of questions they might want to ask you uh, in the meantime um, I suppose I, I have lots of questions for you really and um, I, I think this is a uh, a really interesting approach that, you, that you're taking to the story and I did I did have a look at the story uh, this afternoon I hadn't come across it before um, but my question for you it's a big question it's it's why this story I suppose why why this story in particular um, uh, you know presumably you could have chosen other stories so why why this story and perhaps also why Kipling as well uh, okay I see well first of all uh... <clears throat> My choice of uh, Kipling, I'm, I'm, I'm too familiar with, with Kipling. I've uh, been reading works by Kipling uh, in the past few, uh, few months. And uh, I, well, I chose Kipling because, uh, because of, uh, of the way he is, uh, the way he writes, the, 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 the traditional image uh, uh, that other writers carry about, because I have to read what others say also about him. Um, um, like as I mentioned in the paper, George Orwell mentions that says that Kipling is uh, is is really a, um, a colonialist writer who sometimes take it to the extreme by the way he represents you know people of other colors and other religions etc. My my choice of this uh, um, of this story is uh, is because I I I, I was um, interested in in um, in um, in, I have when I read the story, it's, it's it's too short. But when I read it, I had too many questions in my mind. Like for example, um, the choice of the name of, of the name of the the main characters, Muhammadin, Imam um, uh, the fact that these characters are Muslims uh, made me think about about uh, the translation of this story, um, uh, because I wanted kind of to create as I said a transnational network of um, you know let's say Indian Arab. English communication. I wanted to bring these characters to our context here and see if I translate translate this story into Arabic. How would readers here respond to this translation without? Uh, I mean, if I show them the original translation without changing anything in the story, if I translated it my own way by suppressing these racial elements, how would that make a difference? But as a, as a post-colonial translator, I have to um, uh, let's say um, suppress these elements or. Uh, Change the way the, some of the uh, uh, of the uh, let's say um, some of uh, of uh, Kipling's discourse in the story in order to make uh, or to create a balanced or uh, a racialized version of the story that would not offend um, let's say Arab readers when they if they decide to read the story when they read the story, yeah. Yeah, no, it's fascinating, and I mean, I I have so many more questions that I want to ask you. I'm just gonna, I'm, I'm obviously gonna let. Um, we've got a hand up, and then we've got um, some uh, comments in the in the chat. I'll, I'll just um, I'll just go. Should we go with a hand up first? Then I'll come back to the chat. Do is I've got Amina with a hand up. Do you, do you want to unmute yourself, Amina, and ask your question? Yes, thank you, Joseph. Um, Salam alaikum, Mohammed. Thank you. Alaikum um, my question is related to the question that uh, Joseph just asked. So you sort of half answered it, I suppose. But um, I suppose I'm wondering, from a translator's perspective, I really appreciate uh, what you've done and the way you've used the subtleties of language to kind of suppress, as you said, these uh, the colonial uh, voice. I don't know if that's the way to put it. Um, but I still wonder why um, 
why do you want to give access, I suppose, uh, to this particular writer, given the attitude that he has shown in his writing, uh, rather than translating another writer who has not done that? Do you not feel in a way that this is promoting a writer who is who made his hostility very clear and his intentions with his writing are very clear from the start. Yeah, like, I think that, yeah, that's that's a very good point. Uh, uh, by the way, I <clears throat> these are just examples of the translations I uh, I uh, showed and here my in the presentation, as you can see on the screen. So I have, of course, other examples, but these are just few examples of. Uh, uh, of the translation. Now back to your question. Uh, yes, of course, other writers. There are other writers that uh, you know I they have chosen. I could have chosen uh, to translate, but as a, I thought, I thought that uh, that Kipling's discourse is is too heavy. I mean, it's too loaded with uh, uh, with uh, you know um, references. Uh, to uh, to the superiority of the of the of the colonizer, and yes, that may uh, show that. Uh, that wh why do you, why do you translate uh, a writer who's who's too uh, I mean who's uh, who's who's a, a jingo imperialist as uh, George always says? Uh, wouldn't that, for example, bring to like uh, let's say. Uh, um, um, would it, wouldn't it be better? Wouldn't it be better, be better if I chose other writers? Yeah, but I just want to say something here that as a as a teacher of English literature, I uh, I noticed that uh, many uh, many um, uh, students and people here in the context where I live, where I teach, are not really familiar with this writer, uh, and sometimes I choose him. In order to teach English literature, because I, it's very important to show like versions of. Because uh, I teach, of course, other writers, but I thought that Kipling is also a good example to teach when it comes to the, uh, you know, uh, when, if I want to decide to, if I decide to teach the someone whose uh, whose language, whose stories, whose literature is too loaded with, uh, with let's say, with extreme version of colonialism. Um, so that's one reason I chose him. Um, uh, another reason I chose him. Um, so, uh, of course, my choice of Kipling again was influenced by some reasons, but this is one particular reason uh, because, as I said, because um, I noticed that many people here, especially students at universities, at my home university, for example, are not really too familiar with this writer. So I thought I would, I would translate and then show them the work so that they can decide for themselves. Does that sorry? Does that answer your question? Um, <laughs> no, uh, it, it it sort of does. So, are you saying that your main your target reader for these translations would be someone who is already aware of Kipling's attitudes um, in his writing, and you're providing them with a kind of highlighting that? And allowing them to look at different ways that you could approach the text, is that rather than a, yeah. a reader who who has no understanding of the background of this writer and the original original text. Um, yeah, I mean the target audience um, are of course I, different. We have different varieties of readers, but um, I'm speaking from my position as a, as a teacher of English uh, literature, and I uh, I thought that readers can have you know, of course, they can have access to the original version, but of course, there are other translations that they can read and you know um, see um, um, or compare between um, like other translations. I mean, of course, we find translations of Kipling's into Arabic, but um, but I thought I would offer another you know reading or an another narrative or translation so that. Where I, of course, I used post-colonial uh, framework that in which readers can, um, um, you know, compare between um, different versions, 
of a translation and they see for themselves um, which is better or uh, let's say um, where uh, uh, colonial uh, injustices happen or take place in the text. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, uh, I, I think it, it's really that question for me anyway of, of, of a comparative strategy as well. By, I mean, do you, do you set these texts alongside each other when you're teaching them, for example, Mohammed, you know, and get the students to engage with both, you know, say, I mean, there's a question in the chat, which I'll just pick up on, which is, you, you just answered actually, which is, are there any other translations of the story in Arabic, uh, more literal perhaps? And I think you just answered that question, which is, yes, there are. And, and just to tack on to that, do you situate these two alongside each other when you teach them? Oh, I'm sorry, I, I, uh, I apologize here. I think I made a mistake. I need to paraphrase myself here. Um, I'm, I was talking about Kipling's uh, fiction in general, but this story, as far as I am aware, I don't think it's translated. Okay. Because I, I made my own research and it is not translated. It's it's not uh, you mentioned and uh, you mentioned something, Joe. You said um, you were you were not aware of this story. You just read it this afternoon, and I think I wasn't. I, I didn't know that this uh, you know uh, uh, this story existed. I came by this story by chance. I I didn't know that he wrote this story. But I, I as I said, I liked. Um, I was intrigued by the way he talked about Muslim characters and the fact that he uses Muslim characters. <laughs> Um, uh, that Arab readers, as I said, can easily uh, affiliate with. And uh, I did my own research and I found out that the story wasn't translated before, as far as I know. Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah thanks, Mohammed. That That's very interesting. Um, and I know that I was reading about it. I know it's the first, apparently the first story that he had published uh, and he wrote yeah. it when he was 18 years old. Yeah. Um, can I just, before we uh, go on, I can see um, Dima, you've got a hand up and then I've got another question in the chat. I just wanted to address the first point um, in the chat from Catherine Davies, which is, um, Mohammed, would you be able, and I, would you be able to read the translations in Arabic for those who don't understand Arabic? And that, 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 that sounds a bit strange, may sound a bit strange, but I think what Catherine's getting at is, could you highlight again some of the changes that the key changes that you've made between the the original text and the and the Arabic? Just to recap, would that be okay? Uh, you mean um, the, uh, the 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 quotation I sh the, on the screen? You mean or um, I think either or really, just to highlight a couple of you know some of the main changes that you made. I I, I realise you were discussing those in in your paper. Yeah, of course, in the paper I have. You know, it's full of examples, but I just thought I would show two examples here in my presentation. But as you can see on the screen here, I'm not sure if I can highlight this, uh, but uh, as you can see in the English version, this boy, or English uh, original text, this boy said, Imam Din uh, uh, judicially is a badmash. So the word badmash, for example, is not mentioned in the Arabic translation, it's deleted. Okay, first of all. Okay. The uh, judicially, the word judicially is translated as I added few th few words here, and I changed it as besoutun hasifin yashduku hikmatun, which means in Arabic, like um, uh, speaking, um, let's say, with uh, really wisely. Um, as if he's, he's a wise man who is um, who uh, who speaks to his. Um, Son, not as someone who committed a crime, not as a criminal, but as, as like like a father giving his son a, a lesson about you know um, about about life, about about behavior generally, uh, about good behavior. So you get rid of yeah. legal. Um, yeah, yeah. The 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 word "potmash" is not mentioned. It's in the original text. It's mentioned twice. As you can see here, is is a potmash, a big potmash. But I deleted both words in the Arabic translation, and I changed judicially here. Um, as you can see in the Arabic translation, it's a bit longer because I added a few words. Uh, it's it's longer than the English version because I, I added a few things as well in order to uh, to uh, lessen the intensity of uh, um, of the father's speech. Yeah, the father's words. Yes. 
Thank, thanks very much, Mohammed. I'm going to go straight to, to Dima, who's been patiently waiting with a hand up. Uh, go ahead, please, Dima. Hi, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Hamdan. Very interesting project, uh, indeed. I wondered if what you, if you considered using any kind of notes or footnotes or any forms of paratext to kind of explicate to the Arabic reader sort of what's going on or, or what you're kind of, you know, um, you know, in literary studies, we hate to talk about uh, author intent, but I think in translation, there is a kind of, there's more room for that. And I, I wondered um, if you thought about doing that and, it, and if you didn't, or you thought about it and you didn't, I want to also know why you chose not to uh, uh, take that, uh, to write the, the kind of any form of paratext. Thank you for your talk. Thank you, Dima, uh, and thank you for your question as well. I think as far as, you know, it's been a while since I translated it. Um, as I said before uh, to Joe, I'm not a translator. We were having this, this conversation, Joe, before we started. Um, this is, by the way, I, I normally write on literature, just pure literature. This is the first time I write on translation. I do not also teach translation, but I thought I would go there because I, I like to, uh, you know, uh, write on everything. So. Um, <clears throat> Yes, as far as I know, I added, I think, one or two notes to my translation. And these notes were on, um, you know, concepts that, that a reader, not a reader, would like to know more about. So, yes, I added, uh, but as I said, just, I think, one or two notes. Um, and I think the addition of these notes was necessary because an Arab reader in, in, in a particular context would like to know more about this. So in order to avoid confusion, yes, I did that because, as I said, this is uh, this is uh, an important strategy that writers, and translators, sometimes use in order to explicate things that need explication, such as cultural, uh, you know, things that are related to, uh, or let's say, culture-bound expressions that 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 uh, that need explication. Um, so yeah, I do I do sometimes. Uh, um, do that and in, in the translated version in the, my translation of this story I think I added one or two yes that's right okay Dima is that is that is that all right yeah thank you I mean I I would be interested to and maybe I'll I'll send you an email just because I am obsessed with the with this uh the kind of paratextual elements um just I would be interesting to know like there are some some kind of um, very um, bold decisions that you made as a translator uh, that I'm very interested in. So I would just, you know, uh, be interested to know, like, um, you know, how you would sort of explain that to um, Arabic readers, because you are, you know, to Amina's points, you are kind of, it's a kind of curation that you're doing in a way. You're curating this uh, in a particular way from, of course, the post-colonial lens, but um, it's a sort of translation curation, if I may uh, sort of label it as such and um, uh, find that quite fascinating. So thank you. I see. Yeah, you're welcome, Dima. Thank you very much for your question as well. Thanks so much, Dima. Thank, thanks, Mohammed. I'm going to go straight on. I've got Izidin uh, in the chat who's Haraji. Yeah. He's got a question. We can hear you. Thanks. Hello. Thank you so much. It's really a uh, very fascinating presentation. Uh, I have a question. I'm not sure it's very relevant, but I wonder if the role of you know the post-colonial translator is to, to do this uh, politically correcting of the text or to maybe, you know, reveal the, the power relations. So, so I, I wonder here if, you know, uh, I, I think there is a very similar conversation about art, like slavery art and eliminating it from the public space. Should we just politically correct the public space or should we have, uh, you know, this art as, uh, you know, an evidence of a very important, you know, uh, era of, of uh, you know, the Western uh, history. So, 
yeah, I'm not sure if it's uh, very re relevant, but yeah, this is my question. Thank you. Well, I presume that uh, uh, the, the the simple act of of uh, of just showing showing imbalances in the text is an act of resistance. Okay, but in the field of a translation, a translator, of course, there are different views about this. How how much can a translator intervene in the text? There are opposing views. Some people say that a translator, as I showed in my presentation, can go as far as uh, you know sometimes plagiarizing, which is something that I talked about. When uh, I'm when I mentioned the uh, uh, Arabic translations of uh, uh, of uh, uh, or uh, what Arabic translators, how Arabic translators rendered uh, English and European literatures in uh, in twentieth early twentieth century Egypt, in Egypt, uh, and others say that. No, the, the translator has to be has to be careful. The, 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 the he or she should keep a distance from the text, but because the the, the preservation of of, uh, of uh, the objective narrative or or, uh, or rendering the original text from one language to the other has to be done objectively. Uh, uh, of course, others, as I said, others say that no, a translator is a second author, and he or she has to intervene in order to. Uh, to uh, not only show not only show imbalances within the heart of the text, but also try to sometimes rewrite what is written in order to uh, make it uh, readable and and uh, desirable by different types of readers, by readers who come from different religions, different races, who, are, who belong to different races, who, have, who belong to different religions, who, who come from different cultural backgrounds, and so on. Thank you. Thank you, Mohammed. Thank you, Izzedin. I, I don't know if you wanted to come back on that, uh, Izzedin, or... No. Um, thanks, thanks, Mohammed. I think it's a really interesting uh, comparison to make with the statues because it struck me that in a lot of responses to to the 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 the, the tearing down of statues, um, well, in in some responses, I mean, the point was made that actually history is constantly being rewritten, and so it's not about having these statues as a kind of necessarily as a permanent kind of marker of history rather it's constantly being rewritten so i wonder is there a kind of parallel with the text you know and the original and the way we kind of um, attribute such uh, uh such status to original texts you know actually texts are constantly being rewritten and translation perhaps it's drawing attention to that fact of translation as a, a process of constant reinterpretation and rewriting and certainly here you've got a kind of radical vision of that i think uh, Mohammed. Um, I'll just go to the, the questions um, in the chat, uh, if I may. Um, so we've got a question from, from Adam in the chat. I don't know if Adam, you wanted to come on and ask a question or I could, I could do it for you. That's not a problem. You, if you do want to come on, you should be able to unmute yourself. Uh, you're free to do so. If not, um, I can ask the question. Um, Adam is asking uh, Mohammed about um, whether you uh, prefer to use gender neutral translation in translating the definition of a happy man. And um, he says, I feel that when you employ your own translation on purpose, how could you differentiate between the normative or descriptive and the prescriptive in analyzing your translation? Uh, so Adam is asking about the um, my gender, the, my use of uh, gender specific terms. Is that is it? Sorry. I, I think in, in particular around the the translation of of the happy man. Um, oh, okay. Whether you used a gender, a, 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 did you prefer to use a gender neutral translation in translating the happy man? Yeah, I see. Okay, in, in the in the Arabic translation, as you can see, I have uh, um, yeah, it's 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 here on the screen, as you can see. Um, when I translated "Who's the Happy Man," uh, I translated it as "Man who will insan side." Now, in the Arabic language, an insan could mean man or woman. 
So it doesn't refer to a specific, um, you know, um, gender. So it is. It can be seen. The word insan is is gender neutral. Could mean man or woman. God's creation in the Quran is mentioned in the Holy Quran. <clears throat> the word insan is mentioned as as like people of different genders, different colors, different backgrounds, all people. So it is it is a neutral. I'm not referring to, especially here, the first and the first question. I'm not referring to a specific gender. It's, it includes everyone. The translation includes everyone, because it's philosophical. It's like a, it's a general generic statement. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I understand. Thank thanks, Mohammed. Um, I hope that answers your question, Adam. Um, we've got another question here from uh, Aya in the chat, uh, who's asking about Bakhtin and Mikhail Bakhtin's di uh, dialogism Biologism. and the concept of um, intertextual space and whether that could facilitate the translator's task when dealing with this text loaded with cultural and religious references such as this. Yeah. Uh... Um, sorry, could you again please repeat the question if that's okay? Yeah, sure. So, um, uh, Aya is asking whether Bakhtin's, um, uh, uh, you know, in your opinion, is is Bakhtin's dialogism and his concepts of intertextual space, or the concept of intertextual space rather, can they facilitate the translator's work um, when dealing with a text that's loaded with cultural and religious references? Can they help the translator? Yeah, I think so. That um, I presume that Bakhtin's, um, you know, uh, proposition of the intertextual space, the dialogism, um, can also be um, be used or employed as a as a strategy in order to uh, look for uh, or try to you know to find a ground on which everyone can stand. Um, dialogism. The, the, uh, or the use of the, the, the logic uh, um, strategy means that, well, if, if, if there's that, then there's, if there's this, then there's that. I mean, that, let's say, uh, uh, the presence of a concept, of a certain idea or concept, implies the presence of its other. So this is what exactly I'm trying to do in, the, in my translation. Um, I look for the for the other. I try to take otherization or read otherization and the other as as an intact property or or identity or entity in itself. So Bakhtin's um, uh, employment of dialogism um, um, can be used here in order to create a, let's say a cultural balance or a, a similar background on which everyone can stand. Um, uh, dialogue, uh, Bakhtin's dialogism does not ignore the presence of the other, the importance of the other, as, as, a, as a way of illustration or definition of the self, if we talk about the self and the other in this context. So the, the, the self in this context, uh, the English self, does not actually exist without the presence of the other. We need the other in order to... Um, but as I said, I, I, in this translation, I am... Um, I, um, yeah, we can use the Bakhtin's dialogism in order to um, bring the text to uh, um, to to a place, to to a certain context or place or, or time, um, um, where it can be read similarly or um, uh, let's say uh, justly by different types of readers. Yes. So I just comment on the uh, intertextual space is very important here because this is what we are. This is basically what I'm looking for in the translation to find a, a, a space, a certain space that is uh, that is uh, uh, that represents everyone. Let's say that speaks to everyone. That that is that is common or ordinary or acceptable. Let's say. Uh, I'm not sure if that makes sense, if that answers I as a question. Um, I, I realise I've, I've asked Aya's question without inviting Aya to, to come on screen. You're very welcome to do so if you'd like to come back, Aya. 
um, just while we while we um, while we wait there, um, Mohammed um, Akkad has asked, um, and I think you did. We did. I did mention this at the beginning. He's just thanking you for the talk and and, and asking um, about um, whether this translation is is already published. Will it be? Um, and yeah, I, I think you you did mention to me at the beginning, and perhaps I perhaps we could just repeat it now that it that it will be trans uh, published. That's correct, isn't it? It's not published. I'm trying to make it published. <laughs> so uh, I translated it, but uh, it's not published yet. No. Sorry, I make a mistake. The paper will be published. Is that right? In yes, sorry. The, the paper itself will be published in uh, in a journal called uh, Target, uh, an international journal of translation studies. Uh, but the translation itself is not published. It's my own translation, but I'm trying to get it, to get it published. So I'm talking about the paper itself, the, the research, not the, the, the translation itself. Brilliant. Okay. Thank, thanks, Mohammed. Well, um, I'm I, I'm conscious that we've we've kind of um, we've taken a lot of your time already, Mohammed, and we, you. Okay, you're welcome. I'm, I'm glad to. We uh, responded brilliantly to to the questions and we, we've had a, a, a great discussion. I just wanted, I mean, before we uh, wrap up, I just wanted to obviously thank Mohammed for, for giving such a, a brilliant and interesting paper and to thank the audience for um, asking such brilliant questions and um, uh, uh, and and uh, having such a great discussion. Um, I just wanted to draw your attention as well to the series of events that are going on um, as part of this seminar series. And you can uh, check those out on our website, which is uh, modernlanguages.sas.ac.uk. Uh, uh, and I'll just put that in the uh, chat so you can click on that. Um, if you would like to check out any of the, the other events um, in this series. And um, yeah, I mean, I'll, I, I, we said we'd try and wrap up by about 10 past five. So I'm conscious that, um, Mohammed, it's a bit later where you are in the world. And, it's 10 past seven now here. And, yeah. and just to thank you once again for such a, a wonderful paper. And I hope we can continue the discussion um, at another time. Looking forward to. Uh, hopefully meeting in person at some point. Yeah, um, uh, I would like again, again, to thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Joseph, and uh, to thank everyone who um, uh, joined us today. And uh, hopefully one day in the future, in the in the near future, I would see you in um, in London, or we would come to Palestine here, <laughs> whatever. So uh, thank you very much for uh, for inviting me to speak. Thank you. Thank you, Mohammed, and, and thank you to the audience. Have a good evening, everybody.